right. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Stuart Barner, and um, I'm the Digital Scholarship Coordinator in the Wizards Library at Emory University. And um, this is my speaking partner, Jay Barner. Um, he is the Digital Scholarship Solutions Analyst, uh, also at Emory University. Um, and uh, there is some relation. Uh, we are brothers, have been our whole lives. And, uh, we've had a hard life since then. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, a big part of what we do at Emory is work in what's called the Digital Scholarship Commons. This is a Mellon funded initiative to uh, try to figure out how to build digital scholarship support inside a library that truly takes advantage of being in a library. Um, so what we're, you know, that means a lot of things. We have a, a software development team in the library, so we partner with them. Uh, we have partnered with the metadata librarians when we're working with a scholar who's building out a project. We found that it's good to ask questions about metadata and sustainability and copyright up front before you've spent thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, so, um, so that's what we're trying to do in DISC. Um, so as such, uh, our projects tend to be really collaborative. Um, and uh, the goal is to produce excellent projects uh, that are also technologically sustainable. Um, right now, DISC has about 10 projects going. Um, and half of them are in development, the other half are more or less complete. They were learning that what does it, you know, it's kind of a question, what does it mean to be complete uh, sometimes uh, when you've launched a project? Um, let's see, the projects that we do really vary in scope. Uh, we have uh, some small projects. Um, and uh, you know, for example, um, we're, we have some graduate fellows who work with us, and uh, over the summer, I guess, back up a little bit more, one of our uh, software developers uh, had this idea to write a little Python script that would listen in on Twitter and collect any tweet with the hashtag OWS during the Occupy Wall Street uh, protests. Uh, so this ran for about a year, and we had 10 million tweets. Something like that. Yeah, so at the end of the year, we had 10 million tweets. Um, we had a new cohort of graduate fellows coming in, and I said, you know, hey, graduate fellows, here are 10 million tweets. The one-year anniversary of Occupy Wall Street is in two weeks. Do something. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, they did. Uh, they started a they built a website. Uh, we had to stop them from calling it Occupy Wall Tweet. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the Tweeting OWS uh, website uh, was put together in about two weeks uh, and just does some really pretty basic visualizations on some of these, uh, on, the, on the data. Um, we also, I guess this past, uh, or actually just a few weeks ago, um, we realized that we had a collection, a digitized collection of Abraham Lincoln's, or what was it? Sermons delivered on the occasion of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Uh, so uh, thinking that there might be increased interest in this with the Oscars. We, uh, once again, sort of said to the graduate students, here's the thing, do something. And um, so they ran a bunch of uh, text analytics on this corpus um, and had a good time and built this website. We did let them call that one Lincoln Logarithms. Um, yeah, it's not as good. But, um, so these were small scale projects. They lasted a couple of weeks. Um, they you know, were mainly done by the graduate fellows using open source, freely available tools they found online. Um, we do have some bigger projects uh, that we do. Um, for example, we worked with some faculty in the art history program to take this map of ancient Rome, uh, which was uh, on each of these uh, panels is, I think, maybe two feet by a foot and a half, something like that. So we worked to stitch them together and using Microsoft DeepZoom go in and out of it. Um, 
then uh, we worked with one of the developers in the library to build uh, some functionality in that so that the map can be annotated by students. So this becomes part of a, a classroom project. The students can uh, highlight buildings and write a little something about them, so it's going to be this growing resource. Um, we're also working with some faculty to build a, a mobile app for the Battle of Atlanta to, to help people move through the different sides of the, of the battle. Um, that's, uh, I, I'm afraid that might be the sexiest picture we have right now, uh, but it's uh, still in development. Um, obviously a much longer process uh, than, than two weeks. Oh, let me back up, stay on this slide for a second. Um, so even though, you know, some of these projects are, are a lot bigger, uh, in the grand scheme of things, these actually aren't that big. These, these really aren't that big. Uh, particularly in the grand scheme of things that a large research university like Emory will do, and even in terms of something that a large research library like the Woodruff Library will do. Um, so, um, we, I think we had a problem that, that a lot of other sorts of projects have, which is where can we where can we play? Where can we just build this stuff? Um, so we had a few different uh, alternatives. Uh, we could have used the university web architecture. The the university uh, uses a system called Cascade to build all of its websites. Um, this is a really stable, sustainable thing, and it's really supported. You know, there's a whole office that is dedicated to sustaining websites that are built in. Um, in Cascade. Would this work for all of our projects? No, not really. Um, it was cost effective, um, wasn't very accommodating, it's pretty stable, but it's not very flexible. We moved on to the, the University of Virtual Machines. We can uh, you know, pay for this service uh, to the, through central IT. Um, this is also pretty cost effective. It's relatively accommodating, really. Um, it's pretty stable. Um, it's not very flexible. Uh, it's still, um, and I really shouldn't, that, that's probably not exactly the right way to put it, but what I mean by that is uh, if we have an idea, we can't just do something. We have to you know, contact uh, UTS, so you can contact the central folks and, and negotiate that. It's not a big deal. They're pretty accommodating, but it, it was just one more layer. Um, we could have a box in the library, um, cost effective. Depending on how you look at it, probably. We might have a box just laying around that we could repurpose. Um, accommodating? Not really, because it seems to create some levels of anxiety when you start attaching boxes to networks and then just saying, we're going to do stuff. Don't worry about us. That's, uh, that's not what anyone wants to hear. Um, is it stable? Relatively. I mean, it's, it's stable as a box in, in your life can be. Uh, flexible, <clears throat> maybe, not really. Um, particularly if something, if we built something that was kind of experimental, it's kind of cool, and then we wanted to turn it into something that's public facing. Uh, maybe that box isn't big enough anymore. Maybe it's not robust. Um, so, share hosting service. You know, we could just go get DreamHost accounts, and that would be fine. Relatively cost effective. Not really accommodating, um, probably stable, but not as flexible as we wanted to be. Um, virtual private servers are the same deal. Uh, we got down to uh, Amazon's uh, uh, cloud service, uh, the Elastic Cloud, and that seemed to, to hit all of our buttons pretty well. Uh, but one, uh, I guess one column we left off of this table is, you know, how um, how tried and true is this? This is something that the library hadn't done. So that's definitely a no <laughs> for the Elastic Club. Um, so we thought that it was, um, it, it seemed really promising. Uh, it seemed like something we could try. Um, but um, you know, there's a little concern. What kind of broke the, uh, the tie for us, I guess there were two things. One. This seemed like an exciting direction in which to move. Uh, it would be 
difficult to get sort of production services, enterprise level services, to just move into the cloud and see what happened. Uh, that's probably not what we wanted to do. Uh, but the desk projects are actually small enough and in the grand scheme of things, low stakes enough that we could just do this and see what happened uh, in, in some ways. Um, and the other thing is uh, Jay started working for us or in the library and he actually, uh, at his previous gig, uh, had done a lot of work in the cloud so he had you know, some experience with how all this works. He said, well, this seems like an exciting direction, let's give it a shot. Um, so that's how, that's what we do. That's how we came to the decision to start using this cloud space, the, the Amazon service. And I think that's their logo. I know that's their logo. And I think this is where I hand the clicker to Jay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I'm Jay. I'm the digital scholarship solutions analyst. It's kind of more of a, a kind of a DevOps job for me. I'm, you know, do some programming and I do a lot of system admin. My main background is in systems administration. Um, so I'm going to be a little more technical and talk about sort of, you know, kind of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, so what we're running in OS in AWS, so we basically have, we really have three servers. We're instances in, um, in Amazon. Um, right now, currently in our production server, we have 11 WordPress sites running an auto publishing script there. Some guys on campus that do it, an online journal, and you know they have this whole peer review. So we wrote a script that automatically updates their site for them when they're when they're done. Um, and we have a we saw the Twitter harvest <laughs> going. That's um, one's on. It's a Django app basically that just flush all the heart and flush all the tweets. So we have a development server. This is kind of our playground. Uh, we just kind of do whatever. One there, and all of our backups are done through Amazon. I'm going to go through how how that's done and how we you know maintain our data. So AWS terms. When I was preparing for this talk, I was reading a lot about how you know some people didn't like how you know you had to learn all this new terminology, and it's really not that hard. Um, so like in instance, it's a server. An uh, EBS volume is elastic block storage. It's just an attached storage that you know. It's just like you so much just like plug in a USB drive into a computer. Um, security group, that's your firewall rules. An AMI is um, just a machine image uh, that you you know create a new machine from. It's just all the whole system. And a snapshot is a block level copy of the data that you know is from the elastic block volume. However, you shouldn't think like that when you when you talk about Amazon because the whole point is, you know, you're, you're, it's not a fixed infrastructure. It's an infrastructure as a service. Um, you know, an instance really isn't a server. It's it's all code, and you just have to think about your infrastructure as code. And all these are just building blocks. They're not physical things, and which is great because physical things, as we all know, break down over time. So here's kind of how we have our system, you know, architect with cognos. So there's a security group that is attached. So if you think about it as a programmer, all these are objects. Just each little thing is an object, and you know, you, you move them around and you reuse them and repurpose them. So you know, you don't have to repeat yourself a lot. So that goes to an instance, and in instance, these are my idea here. This is a little shadowed out. It's backed by an AMI, and that's what. Yes, it's created from the AMI. And just like the EBS line with the patch to the instance is backed up by a snapshot. And again, a snapshot is just a, it's a block level copy of the, so it's not, it's not a file based copy backup, it's, it's actually the actual blocks. So, so this is kind of now how we break it down, where the instance is just the bare system, it is just the operating system and the service packages that go with that. All of, all your business stuff needs to be on the EBS volume. And by that I mean yeah, the software stack, the database files, any configuration files live there. The idea is that, you know, we all know servers die. Um, it happens all the time and you know if you architect it this way then you know all your Apache configs, for example, can be on that EBS volume. You don't have to go and you know, remake the server every time it fails. And 
again, I'll get into that a little bit more later. So, but a good example of kind of how this worked was the OWS site that Stuart talked about. Um, so that launched and, you know, it was fine. Uh, but it got a lot of traffic called Brian, our colleague, tweeted it. And he has a lot of Twitter followers and all of a sudden, over 100 people rushed to the site, crashed the database. So Stuart lets me know this happened and I said, I was at jury duty. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, that's a problem. <laughs> and so I got the database back up once, just, you know, tethering my phone, laptop, but then it, it kind of kept crashing. And so on my lunch break, I went to Waffle House because I needed some coffee. And I set up Waffle House and all I did was I stopped the server, I increased the size of it, just the, the instant size, each instance has a different size. Increased the size of it, that gave us more RAM and more CPU, started it back up, and it's been healthy ever since. So this allowed me from a booth at a Waffle House in downtown to fix a problem that if we had been on a UTS uh, server, like a VM, then like, hey, can you make us a new server? And then a day or two later, they would have said, yeah, here's your new server. And then I would have had to copy all that stuff over and rebuild the server on that new one. Whereas here, it took me five minutes and I got to enjoy my coffee on my lunch break. So going back to this model, this is just sort of, this is kind of how it works. So the internet goes into the Amazon EC2 security group. So basically what happened, or so what, what happens if, you know, this instance dies? Which, I mean, if anybody's worked in IT, you know that that happens. And it's, you know, it could happen when the server's a year old, it can happen when it's seven years old. So all we do is take this AMI, create a new instance, move this data volume to, to this instance and start it up. And if you go back and remember, so, you know, the database lives on this, so I don't have to import the database every time. I don't have to like go and find a, a backup dump of the database and import it. The database is already there. And hopefully it's not corrupt. And I can't, and that'll work. If it is corrupt, then we go to a backup. But the fact of the matter is it's really quick because I don't have to go through, I don't have to copy over my Apache configs because they're already there. I don't have to install Apache because it's already installed on the AMI. Uh, you could also obviously use a, um, and probably a better way to do it is to use using a uh, configuration management tool like Top of Shop to apply those packages. But, um, and that's kind of the, you know, the AMI, and building an AMI and, you know, updating it and whatnot, that's, it's a very iterative process, whereas, you know, using something like Top of Shop would be a little more declarative where you just describe the, I don't know, people out of questions we can, we, hopefully we're gonna have plenty of time for questions. Um, all right, so cost is a, is the thing. And, you know, so I was reading, I was kind of reading through various things about the cost. Um, you know, Rackspace is a great, you know, offers a very similar Elastic Cloud. I think that Amazon's a little further ahead in some of their offerings. But I kept reading, it basically kind of came down to if someone was back in Rackspace, Rackspace was cheaper. If someone was back in AWS, AWS was cheaper. So I thought like, all right, we'll just show you our bill. And so we can actually see what they charge for it. Now some people get a little cranky that, like for S3, they charge for get requests, whenever someone, but it's like a penny per 10,000. And I don't know that, you know, that's really gonna hurt us too bad. And I think they just dropped the price. I saw an email when I was getting on the plane to come out here. Um, so this is kind of what they charge for. So you know the different instance sizes I was talking about. You know, so they charge you by the hour, which is a great thing because we our dev server that I mentioned, um, it only runs from seven a.m. to seven p.m. on weekdays. So we have a we're also talking about the API that Amazon has. That you know I can I have a script that runs that on a cron job that every you know morning at seven it starts it up. And every evening at seven, it shuts it down, and then it takes the weekend off, like I do. And um, so we only get charged for those hours that we're using it, which is great. Whereas at UTS, you get them thirty bucks a month, and there's your server. 
So this is a little more flexible in that sense because they're only charging us for the hour. And, you know, so we haven't quite hit our 2 million IO requests yet to, um, but, you know, so that, and these are all kind of minimal charges, but, you know, it is something to think about because if, if you are um, doing a lot, you can, you can start to add up. Um, I think it's still cheaper and it's a better, it's kind of the important thing to remember, like, right? when I was doing this, I realized, like, oh, I don't really need this. I can kind of kill some of those snapshots. I don't really need all of them. It's just one of those things you got to remember to turn the lights out when you leave the room kind of thing. And that's what's, again, great about the API is that, you know, you can automate these things. And, and so it'll last a few addresses and whatnot. And then it's, you know, broken down through different regions. We had, I was playing with something just in the west region to see if I could get them to play nice. Um, so, and different, some of the other regions cost, you know, is a little different price. So I've kind of talked about the pros throughout here, but just to list them out. Um, scalability, like I said, like with the, you know, just making the server bigger within five minutes was great. You know, a better way to do that is they offer elastic load balancers where you can automate that where it would see all the traffic coming in and create new servers as needed and then kill them off as, as, they, as the traffic dies down. And I mean, the scalability part is, I mean, that's, that's the elastic part in the elastic cloud. Um, low admin overhead, like I said, um, you know, we're <laughs> saving money by shutting that server down all the time, but it's not like I have to remember to do it because if that was the case, I wouldn't remember to do it. And so it's, you know, it's very scriptable. Um, you know, even the creating a new server and attaching the volume, you, you could script that pretty easily. Um, which is, you know, the, with the API and uh, yeah. basically anything you can do in the web interface, which is everything obviously you can do. Um, but first they build it in the API and then they push it to their, their web interface. And it makes experimentation easy and cheap. Um, a great example of this is that we're using DBpedia for one of our things and we're, uh, you know, you can actually run your own DBpedia instance if you want to. So we thought that might be fun to try. Um, so apparently the developer who was using that was getting some, you know, the response times were sort of varying. So, um, so I was like, you know, let's, let's try and solve, let's try to run it. And, and we did. And it takes a really big server to run DBpedia. It, it's a lot, it's really RAM intensive. Um, so it wasn't really cost effective, but, you know, we spent 12 bucks one day trying, trying it out. And, you know, so, figured out we couldn't, but you know, if you think about like, well, let's see if this box can run it. Nope, that box can't run it. So now we have to rebuild this other box and then figure out that, oh, well, we need like a $4,000 box to run this. Um, that would have been long, like we spent three hours, 12 months to do it. So, you know, it's just that kind of stuff makes it easy. And again, with the, with the instance itself as in that model that I showed you being, you know, the, breaking the, Breaking out the architecture that way um, makes the server itself really disposable. You really don't have to care about the server itself um, because if you screw it up, you just make another one. You just kill that one and make another one. Um, so it just it just really kind of frees up, particularly from a sysadmin background. You know, like no, don't install that package. I'm going to install. Let's see what happens. You know, it, it really makes experimentation fun and possible. And I think you're going to talk about yeah. nuance. So, um, that probably made everything sound wonderful, uh, but there, uh, there are some, uh, some downsides that, that we found. And some of these things I think we probably suspected and knew, and, and some might have been more of a surprise. Jay made all of that sound easy, right? But there is a little bit of a learning curve uh, to, to figuring this out, and, and this is just uh, what I've heard from other sysadmins, because I'm not a sysadmin. Um, I'm a digital scholarship coordinator. Uh, so um, there, it's obviously a very similar kind of job to what someone who's been taking care of servers uh, for a living has been doing. But the vocabulary is a little different. It's a slightly different mindset. 
you know, you're not, you know, as Jay said, it's not uh, so much dealing with physical machines as codes and scripts. Um, so it's nothing that people can't pick up, um, but, but there is a learning curve. And if someone's been a traditional sysadmin for years, there may be some resistance to doing it this way. Um, fear. There's a lot of different kinds of fear. <laughs> uh, this, uh, uh, you know, one would just be the fear of learning something new if you're, if you're the person that's going to be in charge of taking care of all of this. Uh, another kind of fear, you know, I, and I was thinking about this the other day as I, uh, you know, I burned all my CDs. They're all in Google Music, and I have a Spotify account. And it's really easier to look stuff up on YouTube anyway. And I've got these boxes of CDs that I cannot get rid of because I, I love, and they're all scratched up. Like most of them don't work. The stuff in Spotify doesn't skip, but I'm, I can't get rid of them because what if? Um, just being able to look at your stuff is somehow satisfying. And that's a problem with cloud things. It's out there somewhere. And a pretty big corporation is running it. Um, and and they, they have all my stuff. Now their stuff is way more stable than my stuff. But uh, but you know they could decide this isn't worth it anymore and turn out the lights and, and where are we? And that's sort of one thing for my CD collection. It's another thing if you're a cultural heritage institution that needs to take care of stuff in perpetuity. And if you uh, or, you know, and if you're trying to keep track of a scholarly record that's been cited and will need to continue to be cited uh, for as long as we can proceed. Um, I don't really know what to tell anyone about that. You know, it's, it's out there, I think, that um, the, the system has proved, proved stable. I think that if all of this goes down the tubes, we, at that point, we'll probably have bigger problems. Because that would be a symptom of something bigger that happened. But, um, but it's out there. Um, and it's probably worth trying to figure out what you can risk and what you can't. Uh, outages. This stuff does go down. Uh, I think Omeka had a fairly famous, uh, or at least famous in the digital scholarship you know, their, their Amazon stuff crashed one weekend and it was just, it just wasn't there. It goes out. Um, you know, physical servers that you have in your server room go out as well. <laughs> this happens. Uh, but it's not a perfect system that works all the time and they, you know, no one can guarantee that. Um, this is a little bureaucratic, <coughs> but it's, you get a variable bill. Depending on how much you use, um, your bill is going to be different each month. And whoever's keeping track of your books may not be happy about that. Um, this, this is the, the mindset of, uh, you know, or the mind shift, mindset shift from thinking of uh, server space as a capital investment and in hardware and moving into thinking of it more like a utility. You know, sometimes your water bill is more than it is other months. You know, it's, it's kind of like that. Um, we think. You know, the way we were able to, I, actually I don't know how we were able to talk her into it, she was <laughs> not thrilled, but we, you know, we made the case that this was worth trying uh, and that it probably wouldn't get too astronomical, even if we messed up. Um, so um, I haven't heard any complaints since then, but you know, check with your accountants and see what they think about this. Um, Domain names, DNS. And actually, I'm going to pass that one to Jay. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, we could sort of had some issues with, um, you know, with the institutions getting, you know, a emory.edu domain to point to an IP that's not on Emory, Emory's network. Um, I'm also, we, as the right person asked the other right person, and it just magically happened, but we had sat in a meeting the day before where one of the main guys at UTS was like, no, 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 you cannot do that. So we had registered emorydisk.org, um, but then we somehow, I don't know what Scott did, but he he, weren't, he he just asked the right guy and the guy just did it. 
and but so but you know you can see where that would be an issue with uh, some institutions that um, and mm -hmm. it's not I've, again when I put my sysadmin hat I'm like yeah I get that I get why you wouldn't want to do that um, but I'm glad that they did Okay. Thank you so much.